What's up everyone? John Brettinger from Techno Buffalo here. The iPhone 5 is easily one of the most anticipated handsets of the year, but with a bigger screen comes bigger expectations. Let's put the iPhone 5 through its paces and see if it deserves a spot in your pocket for the next two years. So let's start with one of the most important features of a phone's call quality. Our testing was done on an AT&T unit and it's been absolutely outstanding. I will say though on about 10% of calls, I did have about a one second delay between when I would speak and when the caller could hear me. Haven't had any drop calls whatsoever. The antenna as well has been very strong. Previously we had only two to three bars of HSPA plus. I now get three to four and that same thing is true with LTE as well. And the three mics have made for tremendous call quality. Folks on the other end of the line have not been able to tell that I was even on a cell phone. The hardware, as we've seen with previous Apple products, is absolutely outstanding. Everything has been given the finest amount of detail, from how it feels in your hand to how it sits on the desk. The attention to detail in the corners is really apparent. The anodized aluminum back is absolutely outstanding. We are seeing some reports of the black unit showing scratches each than the white. We haven't had any such problems on our black unit, but you may want to check yours and take it out of the box. The phone feels incredibly light. It's 3.96 ounces are really hardly even noticed in the hand at all. Sometimes it's hard to even appreciate that there's a battery actually in there. So let's talk about what's powering this guy, the new A6 chip. The phone definitely feels faster. At least right now, it's most evidence in boot up time. Incredibly quick. I never thought any previous iPhones were slow, but this one's definitely faster. App load times are very quick, especially when compared to the iPhone 4S or the 4, and Safari load times are especially quick as well. No support on the CDMA phones for voice and data at the same time, and that's for Ryzen and Sprint, and that's through no fault of the carriers. That's due to Apple's chip architecture. So let's talk about the screen, one of the biggest differences of the iPhone 5. It's the same screen as the 4S, just half an inch bigger. It's a 4 inch retina display at the resolution of 640 by 1136. For those of you keeping track at home, that's a 326 PPI. So what does that do for you? It adds an extra row of icons. Essentially the aspect ratio is now 16 by 9. So say goodbye to black bars, you now get full widescreen video, which it's wonderful for. Videos and pictures look great on the screen. You get a bigger landscape keyboard. So if you do a lot of typing in that orientation, you're going to get a really improved experience. It does make reaching for the lock button a bit difficult, which I understand is a bit strange. I've always commented on how much I hated the lock button on the right side of the phone, but I've actually gotten used to it using Samsung devices over the past few months. But if you do have smaller hands, you're going to have to shim the phone a little bit to get to that lock button. Something to keep in mind, you might want to try a phone in your hand before you go and pick one up. The new lightning connector, it works just as well as a 30 pin. It charges and syncs. The reversibility of it is quite nice. Where things get a bit hazy and dicey is in the adapters and accessories. $30 adapter is highway robbery. So I understand Apple had to do it. They wanted to go all digital. They wanted to make it smaller so they can make the devices smaller. I understand that. I think the consumers have understood that as well. But a gesture of good faith would have been including an adapter in the box. When the iPhone first originally launched, it included a dock. Nothing that was necessary to the phone, but it was a really nice gesture on Apple's part. I would have liked to have seen that be repeated and have some sort of adapter included with purchase. Another big improvement here is true 4G data. We've got LTE and it is fast. On at and I'm getting speeds about twice as fast as HSPA+. I am having poor wall penetration though versus competitors that may be due just to younger network and that's only on LTE. So be wary if you're going to rely on LTE where you're at. You might want to double check to make sure you're going to get a strong signal indoors. So you've got a bigger screen, you've got a faster processor, you've got 4G data. How is that going to affect battery life? Apple claims battery life is a bit better than the 4S. In my experience though, that's not true. Oh, with LTE on, I'm getting about 10% less than I did with the iPhone 4S. So if you have a 4S and you end the day with more than 10%, you'll be fine. And a bit of a disclaimer, I didn't do any battery saving. I had the brightness turned on about 80%. I had email being pulled down every 15 minutes, text messages, a couple hours of phone calls, and I ended the day with about 20% battery life. Apple claimed you should get about eight hours of talk time. I found that to be just about true. So there's been a lot of talk about the camera on the iPhone 5. We did a video comparing the 5 to the 4S. We noticed actually little difference in the still images, even in low light, which Apple was really touting. Video, that was another story. Image stabilization really helped the video quality. And the mic in the iPhone 5 sounded much better than the 4S. The front facing camera also was great now for taking self portraits. And of course you got 720p for improved FaceTime or Skyping with your friends, family, or acquaintances. Panorama is also a really cool additional feature, something that we've had though in apps and other phones have had for quite a while, but it is nice to see it natively make its way to iOS. 
Some are reporting Wi-Fi issues, we haven't had any with our unit. I'm then actually noticing tremendous increase in speed and range, and that's due to its multi-band support of 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz. So if you've got a router that broadcasts both, you're going to notice incredible range. When I pull into my garage, usually I maybe would have one bar of Wi-Fi. Now I've got full Wi-Fi signal, and it's fast Wi-Fi signal. So we've talked quite a bit about the hardware on the iPhone 5. Let's talk about the software that's powering it. Let's begin with what Apple got right in iOS 6. The app experience really is incredible with the iPhone. I've been using Android devices for the past six months, and I forgot how great it is when developers only have to code for one device. Although now they technically have to code for two screen sizes. But really, when it comes to experience and speed, I've noticed the iPhone really being an improvement there. Letterboxing is a pretty good solution for fragmentation. It's up to developers, though, on how they want to implement or whether or not they decide they want to implement it at all. If you've got a black iPhone, you'll hardly even notice it. The difference between the black outside bezel and the black screen just looks like a little smaller display. On the white phone, it's going to be a bit more evident, so you might want to keep that in mind to decide which color to pick up. Siri also has seen a lot of improvement. Although it's still in beta, it's now much faster. Initially, we compared it with Google Search, and it got blown away. Now, though, totally different story. They are on par, and some would say Siri's even better. She now speaks more naturally. You have a less robotic voice. You have more options for what you can do. You can search for sports movies or even open applications and I think there's even a hint of a southern accent in there. Facebook integration as well is really nice. Apple's ecosystem just works. If you use a Mac or you want to do syncing with iCloud, including backups, everything just works really well. And shared photo treatment is also a very nice feature. So what's wrong in iOS 6? Well, I wish there was some way to dial from the home screen, similar to what you can do in Android. I know there are apps that'll sort of do that, but instead of having to hit the phone button, go to favorites, and then dial, or hit the phone button, go to contacts, scroll, and find the person you want. I wish I could just dial, like my wife, for example, right from the home screen. Also, there's no quick way to view information, similar to widgets in Android or live tiles in Windows 8. I would have really liked to have seen some way to do that, as opposed to having to open up the application itself. Also, no landscape support. For example, if you're typing a note or anything that requires a landscape keyboard, you want to multitask, still in the opposite orientation. I would have liked to have seen some sort of landscape support in iOS 6. You have a beautiful four inch screen. When I rotate the phone, I want the operating system to rotate with it. Siri, while she has improved, I wish she could do a bit more and control settings, which I could turn on and off Wi Fi, Bluetooth, or brightness. Next, let's talk about Maps. Google Maps was absolutely tremendous. It was a great, advanced operating system. It had been aged and honed. It was like a fine wine of software. And Apple said, no more. They replaced it with something not new really is good. When you're replacing something that's been really solid and tried and true to something not as solid or tried and true, there is going to be backlash. And Apple has really seen that with maps. And not to say it's all bad. Turn by turn direction actually works pretty well, but there are some glaring features. Flyover is neat to see, but instead of seeing buildings in 3D, I'd much rather see some version of street view. So I'm going to a restaurant. I want to know what it looks like when I get there, so I'm not driving right past it. I don't really need to see what the tops of buildings look like. But I do expect subsequent versions of the operating system should improve the map experience. Apple is actively looking to hire, even rumors that they're hiring folks from the Google Maps team. So I expect Maps to become up very, very quickly. And then YouTube, keeping in line with what I did with Maps, any native Google application is now gone. It's been replaced on the iPhone with Google's own version, which give you the same navigation you've seen with Android. I preferred the way Apple did their YouTube application, but that's just a personal preference. Passbook, I'm not sure where this one falls in the good category or the bad category. Right now, it's a bit useless, but it has potential to be useful. If you ever bought movie tickets on your phone and you have to take it in and have them scan it, essentially all Passbook does, it takes that barcode, and that QR code, whatever it might be, puts it on one place. Same thing with concert tickets, baseball tickets, and hopefully at some point with gift cards as well. And as developers start developing more apps for Passbook, it may get more useful. But the lack of NFC is really going to limit what Passbook can do. So what's the conclusion here? This is hands down the best iPhone yet. If you have an iPhone 4 or earlier, it's a great upgrade, absolutely going to be worth it. If you have a 4S, only upgrade if LTE and a bigger screen are must-haves. Otherwise, the majority of the features are OS-based we had just by updating to iOS 6. As usual, Apple Apple's years ahead of the competition when it comes to design, materials, and build quality. The only company that comes close is HTC, and it's a very distant second. The OS, when it was first released, really matched the hardware in terms of innovation. However, in subsequent versions, it's really fallen short. Not to say the operating system doesn't work. It works very well and it's very capable. It's just starting to show its age. Anyone looking to buy an iPhone or any smartphone, this is going to be a great purchase for you. So what does this get in the Techno Buffalo scale? 1 to 10, this phone gets a very solid 9. Points deducted for software, no voice and data over the CDMA networks, and lack of NFC. If you're in the market for a smartphone, this is going to be a great choice and it'll do a wonderful job keeping your company for the next two years. I'm John Rettinger from Techno Buffalo. Be sure to check us out for the latest and greatest tech news at technobuffalo.com.